Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for another day of Aquarium Online Academy. Uh, my name is Sergio, I'm part of the education team here at the Aquarium. And behind the camera working all of this, you know, magic, this movie magic behind me, is my friend and co-worker Amanda. Hi Amanda. <laughs> so today we are going to be talking about a really interesting topic. I think it's a really fascinating one, one that we don't always hear too much about, but we're starting to hear more about, especially at here, places like the aquarium, because it's tied to some really important things that are happening all around the world um, with our weather and other things that we're going to get into later. But before we jump too much into our topics for the day, I do want to mention that if you've joined our uh, Aquarium Online Academies before, then you might be familiar that this is a live experience. If you haven't, well, good news, this is a live experience. So if you're watching right now on December 5th at 10 o'clock, you're more than welcome to text in some questions or answers to my questions. If you want to do that, you're just going to use that number right below me, that 562-286-1838. Now, if you're watching this at a later time, you couldn't quite make it to our 10 o'clock uh, live screening, but you still have some questions that you want aquarium staff to answer later down the road, then you're more than welcome to send those questions to that email right below that number, that live at lbaop. Dot org. Great. So again, that number will be up for the remainder of this video, and please feel free to use it. I love when we get to have some communication going on, so it's not just me talking at the camera. But today, I think it's going to be a great opportunity to ask a lot of questions, because this might be a topic that you might not be as familiar with. The topic for today is coral. What the heck is that? What is a coral? Well, we're going to start to break that down, but before we do, I want to actually take some time to look at the habitat behind me. So I'm going to step off camera here, but I'll still kind of be talking and guide us through what we're seeing. But this right here is a highlight reel of, some, of one of our real exhibits here at the aquarium in Long Beach, California. I believe this is our coral habitat. Now we'll touch back in on what that means, what it means to be a coral predator a little bit later in our program. But for today, I want you guys to take a look and let's just start making some observations, okay? So see if you can identify where in this habitat, what's the coral? What is coral? Where is it here? And what other animals do you see? What observations can you make about these, about this habitat and its inhabitants? You can think about things like the colors of these animals or the colors of their environment shape. Things like that are going to be really useful for our conversation today. Hmm. I'll give you guys a few seconds to kind of think about that. And again, if you want to send in your responses to questions like, what colors do you see? Or where are coral in this video? You can always text to that number 562-286-1838. All right, so now when we're looking for coral in our habitat here, now this one is gonna be kind of an interesting one because most of the coral here are what we call artificial coral, meaning that they're not real coral, they're kind of sculpted ones that we add to the habitat to try to recreate a natural environment for these animals. And now you might be wondering, and so the artificial coral here are all of these structures that you see like this one there, that yellow one there, and then this big red one including the smaller green ones that you see at the side, those tubes. All of those things are corals, or at least replicas of coral. Now, you might be wondering, well, why are we putting fake coral? Why don't we just put real coral in there? And that's a wonderful question. Part of that is actually going to best be understood by first taking a look at what exactly coral even is. I think once we understand what coral is, you'll kind of understand a little bit better as well why it's difficult for places like aquariums to just put coral everywhere. All right, so next I'm going to ask a question. Ooh, this is a great uh, image of a coral behind me. It's pretty close up. And so like now, I'll step off so you can see the whole thing, but you see this full view. This is a real life coral. And now does this look like the coral we were seeing before? It might, it might not. Of course, this is a little bit closer of a view. But... I want to ask everybody watching a question. We're going to break down what coral is. Now, I'm going to give you some options. 
and you can tell me, do you think coral is A, an animal? Is it B, a plant? Or C, a type of rock or inanimate object? I mean, not a living object. Hmm, is coral an animal, a plant, or a rock? What do you guys think? Thinking about the artificial coral coral that you see now. Hmm. And of course, there's a lot of different kinds of corals. Different sizes. Ooh, here's a set of images behind me of some of those corals. And I believe these ones are also from the aquarium, but these are some of our real corals. So not artificial corals, but real corals that are being grown in this habitat. Ooh, so we're getting some responses that some people think it's an animal. Okay, that's a good instinct. Is it any votes for plants or rocks? Well, if you said animal, you are correct. If you said plant, you're also kind of correct. And if you said rock, you're also still kind of correct. Yeah, so that's why I said that this is going to be a very interesting day because corals are really interesting parts of nature because they don't quite fit exactly nice and neat into a single category that will you know those kinds of categories that we like to use to define the world around us corals are one of those things that don't quite fit perfectly so for the most part corals are an animal but now let's go back to that kind of close-up Coral that we saw before with all of those little things kind of coming out of it. Let's see if we can get that back up there because that's going to also give us a little idea of what exactly, what kind of animal these corals are. So if you see that, these, we call these polyps. And now I am using the plural tense, meaning that there's multiple. And so all of these little polyps, each of these little tubes with the tentacles at the end, those are all individual little animals. That's right. So a coral isn't just one animal. It's actually made up of sometimes thousands, sometimes hundreds, various amounts of little coral polyps. So a single coral is actually hundreds or thousands of animals, depending on how big it is. Of these little tubes, the little tentacles on the end, those are each individual polyps, and those are all part of those coral structures. So, all of those live corals that you saw uh, just a second ago, artificial corals, hypothetically, each of them are filled with thousands of these little polyps. This is a pretty good close up view. And the corals, they might look a little bit more uh, fluid, might be a little bit. These have polyps as well just a little bit tinier. So that's the part of an animal. If you think about that structure, the little tube structure with those tentacles at the end, are there any other animals out in the ocean that they by any chance? Hmm. Does that look like you might be familiar with? Ooh, someone asked, can you eat corals? That's a great question. I don't know. I, my instincts tell me that no, we don't eat corals. But there are some animals that do, like our parrotfish. This is a great one. It's a slightly haunting photo in my opinion. But I mean, look at that cute smile. <laughs> so this is a parrotfish. That is not, we did not Photoshop teeth into that. That is just what their beak looks like. And I put kind of quotation marks around that. So back when I was playing, when I first hopped on camera, we were in our coral habitat. We coral predators. That's because of these guys right here, the parrotfish. We call them parrotfish because they have those teeth. This is a great video or a great image because you can see how all of those little teeth, they do have individual teeth, kind of bumpy towards the end there, but they are all fused together to make that beautiful smile right there. So their teeth are all fused together and it creates kind of like a beak. So we call it a beak. But all those teeth fused together are because this parrotfish eats corals. That's right. They eat the hard corals, including the, the little polyps that you saw in there. And we'll break down what the hard parts of it look like a little in a second here. 
but they'll actually use those to chew them up. Ooh, this is a great picture here. This is an even closer image of a tiny little polyp. And this actually gets to uh, what we were talking about, about trying to define a coral, right? Because we said, we talked about how it's an animal, right? So there's an animal. So this is the animal. This is the polyp there. You see the tube with the tentacles like we were looking at before. And what I was kind of alluding to earlier was that, doesn't it kind of look like a jellyfish? You kind of turn your head upside down or an anemone, right? And that's because anemones, jellies, and corals, look at that. Don't all of these animals, what do you notice about them? They all share those tentacles, right? And that general kind of shape, a uh, sort of tube or circular shape between them. That's because they're all in the same family of animals known as the nadarians. And so what really defines them is that they have tentacles with stinging cells inside of them. So inside of their tentacles are between the jellies, the anemones, and these corals. They all have stingers inside of those tentacles, which is a pretty cool thing. So that's the animal. So back to this image here. Now, remember I said, though, that if you said that, in a, that a coral is like a plant, you are also right about that. Because corals actually have a symbiotic relationship with a certain, not quite a plant, but an algae. So if you're wondering, what's the difference between a plant and an algae? Mm, they're pretty similar, but they're not exactly the same. Algae don't quite have all of the structures that a plant does. Um, but the thing that they share that makes them the most similar is that they're both able to produce uh, or do photosynthesis. So does anyone watching know what photosynthesis is by any chance? Does anyone want to try to define it for me? Give you guys a chance there. But it's something that all plants do. Algae does it as well, right? And things like phytoplankton in the ocean do that as well. And it's how plants and algae produce energy. So whereas animals have to consume things, so eat other animals or eat plants in order to get energy from them, well, plants don't have to do that, right? They instead take energy in from the sun. So they get energy from the sun and that through photosynthesis is how they're able to produce different sugar, produces energy for them. Well, the reason that we say that, uh, uh, that corals are like plants as well is because yes, they are animals and they do actually eat. They use those tentacles, sorry, this side, they use their tentacles to catch little, little plankton, little animals uh, in the ocean, but they also have algae living inside of them. Now, if you look in this image here, all of those little specks, those little yellow dots and little clusters, those are actually clusters of algae. Now, corals, they use a very specific kind of algae. It's called zooxanthellae. I hope I pronounced that right. I'm not always great with my pronunciation. But zooxanthellae. Now, it's a type of algae, and again, it produces photosynthesis. And the reason that it's hanging out inside of this coral is because they have a symbiotic relationship. Like, I mean, what does that mean? Well, a symbiotic relationship in nature is when two things uh, kind of work together to both benefit from each other. A great example of a symbiotic relationship is the clownfish. So clownfish will be hanging out around corals or anemones, both, right? They're both closely related, anemones and corals, and clownfish benefit from both of those things. So just like how clownfish benefit from or being around anemones and corals. Those anemones and corals, because of those tentacles that they have, that gives them a place to hide. And they actually have a layer of kind of like mucus around them that protects them from their stings. So they actually don't get stung by the corals or the anemones. And so they're able to hide in the corals or the anemones. And in return, when they, uh, when they go and get food and when they're eating their little scraps of food, some of those crumbs basically will fall into the anemones or the corals so they kind of help provide it food but they also provide it with uh, a nice symbiotic relationship where they're able to work together so they're kind of working together getting food from each other but also protection and a place to hide from each other Ooh, great question so we have some questions coming in some of them are how long have corals been around, and do corals have brains? Okay, so corals have been around for about 500 million years. That's a really long time. 
And that makes sense because they're very simple animals. They're very simple things, right? Not just animals, but they're a very simple form of life. Remember, they're related to jellyfish and jellies. Sorry, not jelly, sea jellies. That's what we call them here at the aquarium. But sea jellies, anemones, and corals, they were some of the first things, especially those jellies, were some of the first things to evolve on our planet. And you can kind of kind of make sense because they're so simple. I know they look kind of like aliens sometimes, but they're very simple living organisms. They have no brain. They have none of those structures that we're used to thinking of as animals having, like um, no heart, no lungs. They interact with the world around them in a very simple way. They don't usually have eyes. Sometimes they have what we call eye spots. And that just allows them to see the difference between light and dark. So they can see if it's kind of bright out or if it's dark out, so if it's nighttime or daytime. But they don't see any structure like we do, no depth perception, nothing like that. So they've been around for a really, really long time. They're some of the first forms of life to evolve on our planet. And they're still around, which is a really amazing thing. Now, if we think back to the, that relationship between the algae and the, uh, and the polyps themselves, the corals, that's why I was saying that they're kind of like plants. The same way that the clownfish interact and uh, symbiotically have that relationship with the corals or the anemones, well, the anemones and, or sorry, the corals have that same relationship with the zooxanthellae, the algae that lives inside of them. Now, like I said, those corals are able to eat just like any other animal, but most of their energy actually comes from the, uh, the sugars that are produced by the algae inside of them. So the, what, even though the algae lives inside of them, they're still producing photosynthesis. And they actually share that energy that they produce from the sun with the polyps of the coral themselves. So that's actually where most of that coral's energy comes from, is from that photosynthesis. So they're not quite doing it themselves, but the zooxanthellae, the algae inside of them, is doing it for them. And in return, the zooxanthellae gets a nice home, a protection, a layer of protection by being inside of the coral, right? So that's how we have plants. Corals can be like plants, they can be like animals, but they can also kind of be like rocks, I mentioned. And the reason for that is because of what's underneath those polyps. So I'm gonna actually have you guys join me over at my document camera because I want to show you something that we, a coral skeleton. Now, if you joined us earlier, around nine o'clock, and watched our program about octopus, you might be familiar with a phrase or a term called invertebrates. Now, an invertebrate is just any animal that doesn't have backbone, has no bones in its body. Corals are invertebrates. They don't have any bones. So you might be wondering, well then, why are we saying that this is a coral skeleton? Well, they don't quite have a skeleton because it's not actually inside of their internal anatomy, but corals are able to kind of create their own, you can think of it as like a shell, but instead of covering them on the outside, it's actually underneath them. So in that image that we saw with all the little coral polyps, all those little tentacles coming out underneath that, was this and you can actually see where they were so each of these little craters that you see in here those are all spots where a individual polyp was living in so corals are actually kind of like i kind of describe them like apartment buildings right so it's like one single structure that houses a bunch of different living organisms in this case they're all the same so all polyps Will live in these little holes and so they're actually able to create these i believe this calcium based uh skeleton if you will but it's more of like a shell think of it more of the way that snails produce their own shells that's basically what these corals are doing and they form it not on top of them or to cover them up but to provide somewhere for them to attach to oh somebody's saying it looks like a meteorite it does kind of look like a meteorite especially with all these little craters right here, let me show you some more coral skeletons here because you might see some differences. So here's another one from a different type of, of coral. And this one, let me see if I could zoom in. Because this one, its polyps are a lot smaller. So you can see they're not as obvious, but you can see all of those little places where those polyps would be. Let me show you one more. Again, so this one's different. You can again see 
a lot smaller, but again, where all of those little polyps are. Right there, that's a great focus. So you can see that corals do in fact come in a lot of different shapes, a lot of different sizes, but at the end of the day, they're largely the same, right? They're polyps attached to a hard kind of carbon base or calcium base, and they have those polyp structures with those two bodies and those tentacles towards the top. Ooh, somebody said that one looks like packing peanuts. It kind of does, like this one, right? Let's go ahead and let's look at some different corals uh, when they have them fully, when they're fully alive. So let's look at one of my favorites called the brain coral. I think this one's a really cool one. Let me see if you can tell why it's called the brain coral. Hmm. Let's see. Now, when you look at this one, I want you to try to see, look closely from the image, if you can see all of those polyps or kind of where they are. Sometimes it's really hard to tell because you don't quite see. Not all coral is as floaty or as uh, tentacly. Sometimes those polyps live really close in. Ooh, here we go. So that brain coral. Do you guys see why we call this a brain coral? That looks like a brain, right? So you can see those along the edges and all of that color that you see there, those all of those polyps. And now, that's actually a great point, talking about the color of corals. Because going from this image to the coral skeletons that we were looking at before, those skeletons were completely white, right? But all the corals that we've looked at today so far, they all have very bright colors. If we uh, maybe go back to one of our uh, feeds of one of our coral habitats, you'll see all those bright colors going around. And that was something that I kind of alluded to when I asked you to look at observations about the animals that live here, right? So all of the animals that live here, they're adapted for this environment. Part of the way that we know that is because we can look at the colors on them and compare that to their habitat. So corals are come in many different shapes, many different sizes, but also many different and all of the color of them is also coming from that algae that we talked about. The zooxanthellae, the color of that algae is what affects the color of the corals. And in turn, the animals that live in these coral reefs, and that's what we call an area that's made up of a bunch of corals, in these coral reefs, the animals that live there have to kind of be able to blend in, right? Because you can kind of see it in this image, but a lot of these animals are swimming around the coral. But look at the shape of some of these fish, right? A lot of these fish are either flat, right, or they're small and narrow. And that's because they're living in coral reefs. And these corals, as you can see, they have a lot of different nooks and crannies and a lot of spaces where different animals can fit in. Think back to that clownfish relationship, right? So because of that, not only are the colors of these animals affected, but also the shapes of them. They're adapted in shape and color to be able to fit in between corals and then blend into them by having colorful flat or narrow bodies and that's something that i think is pretty amazing now taking a kind of look outwards you can, i talked about coral reefs so that's what we call these entire habitats where that are uh, made up of long stretches of coral now you might be familiar with that term coral reefs some of the biggest coral reefs that we see are in places like Australia, right? The Great Barrier Reef, you might've heard of it. Uh, but most coral reefs, or almost all coral reefs, are gonna be found along the equator. That means that's the middle of the planet. So if you think about the planet, right, as a sphere, if you draw a line going through the middle, right there, that is what we call the equator. And that's usually the warmest part of our planet. And now, the reason that uh, corals are usually found there is because they are found in tropical environments. They need slightly warm water. They're not going to survive really well in cold water like our Pacific Ocean, right? So if you're from California like I am, off our coastline, we're not going to quite find corals because our water is a little too cold. But in those more tropical environments like off the coast of Australia, uh, you're going to find, or places like Hawaii, you're going to find coral reefs because the water is the right temperature. Now, that temperature, though, also has to do 
with why we're seeing less and less corals. So you might be familiar with a something called coral bleaching. Now that is a term for what happens when lots of corals start dying off at the same time or around each other. So we have a question. Are, someone asks, are all coral white when they die? Absolutely. So that goes back to that idea of coral bleaching. That's why it's called coral bleaching. You might use bleach for laundry, right? It helps make uh, white clothes even whiter. But in this case, it's referring to how corals go from really colorful to pure white. And so, yeah, so all corals are going to turn that white. Sometimes they'll kind of be almost like a brown murky color until as the, uh, the algae and the polyps are dying off. But then eventually all you're left with is that white skeleton, skeleton left behind. And that is usually due to climate change or changes in temperature in the ocean, which is loosely connected to climate change on a bigger scale, right? So when the temperatures in the water get too warm, then something really specific starts to happen. It interrupts the relationship between the coral itself and the zooxanthellae, the algae that was living inside of it. Because that algae, like most algae, is really sensitive to temperature. So when the temperature of the water gets too warm, it will actually, the algae will actually leave the coral. So it'll exit out of the coral's body and it'll go floating to somewhere else in search of better temperatures that it could actually survive in. Because if it stays in there for too long, that algae will actually die off as well. So when that algae leaves the coral's body, remember how I said that that algae is the main source of its energy? Well, without that algae present, the polyps themselves, the part that's an animal of that coral, will slowly start to die off because they don't have enough energy to keep them alive. So that's when you start to see their color being lost and over time as those polyps die off, you're left with just that coral skeleton left behind. Now, thankfully, there's places like the Aquarium of the Pacific and other institutions that are taking on different projects to try to remedy this and help preserve corals around the world. One of them specifically is called Seacore, and that is an organization that we here at the Aquarium work really closely with. I think we might have some images of some of the uh, things that they're doing, some of the tools that they're using to create, uh, to recreate these environments. <coughs> Sorry, there I had a cough. <coughs> Sorry. But those C-Core groups, they're doing coral restoration in places like Guam. So remember those tropical environments. And what they are doing is they are putting together different, uh, they're grabbing different corals to provide more genetic diversity between the corals themselves. So corals can reproduce in a couple different kinds of ways, asexually and sexually. But the best way is to when you can combine multiple corals to produce new diverse members of that population. And so that's what C core is doing. They actually have these pretty cool um, little structures that they'll take new corals and kind of stick them to, kind of like if they're making a, a artificial little skeleton for them to sit on, and then they'll raise them in really controlled conditions so that they can control the uh, temperature of the water and really make sure that they're growing nice and strong. And then they'll actually go to different places around the world. Most of the time it's in that Guam area. And they will actually spread those corals back out. So they're taking the kind of hardest part of actually raising coral, right? Because that's when they're the most sensitive to these changes in temperature. So they're doing that in controlled environments and then taking them out once they're nice and tough and kind of older, they take them out back into their environments and they put them back into those habitats. So that's just a small example of one of the organizations that we work with. Oh, here's a great picture of some of that that's going on. You can see them kind of making observations about corals and then they'll reintroduce or introduce new corals into those habitats. It's pretty amazing work. Now that's, like I said, a, uh, the organization known as C-Corps. But of course, there are things that we as individuals can do. I mentioned that a lot of this is tied to things like climate change, right? Where the weather and temperatures on our planet are starting to become a little inhospitable to different organisms like these corals. Of course, there's a lot of stuff that we can do, like trying to lower our carbon emissions. One of the main ones that we say here at the aquarium is to try to eat more seafood. Kind of sounds a little funny, right? For 
someone at an aquarium to be telling you to eat more fish. But seafood is actually one of the most sustainable methods of for humans to actually get food, right? Because it doesn't take any land, so we don't have to interrupt the land. We also, it takes less carbon emissions because we don't have animals like uh, cows or other grazers that are putting other uh, greenhouse gases like methane into the air. And it's just, as long as it's done properly, it can be really sustainable. So that's one of the ways that we like to encourage people. But really, just think about the different actions that you take in your everyday life. Try to make more environmentally cautious opportunities. Oh, here's a great picture of those little baby corals growing on those uh, on those things that I was mentioning. So that's where they would be growing and then they would reintroduce them. That's them without too many corals on them. So then they're brand new ones and then corals will grow on them and then they'll introduce them back into their habitats once they look a little bit more like this, a little more developed. But that brings us to the end of our day. So I just want to say thank you everybody for joining me today uh, for our Aquarium Online Academy. Uh, I hope to see you guys again or to speak with you guys again. Thank you for everyone who submitted some questions. I hope that we got to at least most of them. Um, but other than that, oh, do we have one before we go? No? Okay, no worries. So have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you guys for joining us. See you next time.